You are welcome to this Lesson 14 on the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 27. As usual, the material that we shall share here can be downloaded in documents from our website at hebrews.cura.download. Let's get into it. The first two verses of chapter 12 are amongst the most frequently quoted and preached on in Christian churches. It reads, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The epistle was written in the third quarter of the first century CE by Apollos of Alexandria, or possibly someone else such as the Apostle Luke. As with all of the New Testament books, Hebrews has been very well preserved across the centuries. Nevertheless, some interesting variants have been introduced by copyists within the first five centuries, for example, at verse 12, at verse 13, a few ancient manuscripts have the aorist tense, make straight, instead of the present tense, keep making straight. In verse 15, a few other ancient manuscripts, perhaps recalling the phrase, the many, in chapter 9, insert a definite article, the, before the term many. And in verse 23, one ancient manuscript reads, perfected men made just instead of just men made perfect. A number of vocabulary words from this chapter are best understood by their original meaning found in Greek lexicons. The chapter starts with a strong Greek inferential particle, therefore, in the first position, giving it emphasis, tying this chapter with the material of chapter 11. The term witness, martyr, first means one who testifies in legal matters, a witness, that is, one who affirms or attests, anyone who can or should testify to anything. Thus, a witness is one who is telling what he or she knows, and not merely someone who is watching others do something. In verse 2, we are admonished to consider Jesus, which requires to reason with careful deliberation. The term despise is to consider something not important enough to be an object of concern when evaluated against something else such as the joy that was set before Jesus. The author wants us Christians to consider our difficulties, especially persecutions, as a form of discipline, a term relating mainly to the rearing of children, to provide instruction for informed, responsible living, to educate, to assist us in the development of our ability to make appropriate choices that is, to practice discipline. And the word chastise means to punish with discipline in mind, not merely to aggravate. Verse 9, to be in subjection, is something that we ourselves do. It is not a stronger authority forcing us into submission. It is submission involving recognition of an ordered structure, that is, to an entity to whom or to which appropriate respect is shown. In verse 25, the warning is against refusing the Lord Jesus. Originally, the term meant to make a request or to avert something by request or entreaty, and eventually to decline, refuse, avoid, or 
to purposely reject, hence the term to turn away, which for us means to turn away from by rejecting, or to turn back to our old ways by abandoning faith in Jesus. Hebrews 12 begins with an especially strong inference. For this, therefore, connecting this chapter with the preceding stories of those who kept faith despite delay and persecution. The word sin in verses 1 and 4 has a definite article, the, which points to the specific sin that poses a danger to all Christians which is mentioned often in this epistle. Thus, the sin that can easily entangle us of verses 1 and 4 relates to failure to keep faith, that is, to give up faith in Jesus, who himself endured persecution and died to save us. The sin in this context is not a matter of personal bad habits or even of moral failure, but of abandoning Christian faith to avoid loss of property or to escape persecution. Hence, victory over the sin comes from our endurance by looking unto Jesus who saves us, not by our feeling badly about personal failures. The Hebrew Christians had suffered some loss of property after they declared their faith in Jesus, but few, if any, had yet been martyred, that is, put to death. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, and you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, some historians have asserted that the epistle to the Hebrews was not written until the second century after there was some official persecution. However, there were doubtless other forms of opposition, just as there remain to this day in some countries. For example, landlords, hostile religious and civil authorities, Lenders, gangsters, and even family leaders may seize our land, our possessions, our spouses and children from those of us who profess faith in Jesus. Oh, if you would like to donate to help Christian Afghans escape to a safe place, then we recommend you contact this site. For any verse of the Bible, the New Testament in particular, the meaning of a verse or sentence is always connected with the wider paragraph, that is, the discourse. Dr. Westfield has pointed out that we are currently in the third major section of the book of Hebrews. We are partners in Jesus' heavenly calling, in particular, subpoint B, an exhortation to serve God as priests in the heavenly Jerusalem. Chapter 12 is developing the thesis stated in the previous chapter that it was by their faith that the believers under the first covenant received their commendation from God. From that, our text draws an inference. Therefore, let us run with endurance, looking to Jesus who endured the cross. With an explanation, for Jesus endured from sinners hostility against himself. And a purpose is stated that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted, expanded by an exhortation to recall Proverbs chapter 3 regarding discipline, that God is treating you as his sons, and that God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Thus, discipline yields the peaceful fruit, which is righteousness, for those who are trained thereby. This leads to a further inference, whereby be healed.
through this exhortation, strive to live at peace with everyone and obtain and live by the grace of God whilst avoiding immorality and godlessness. By way of explanation or illustration, for Esau found no change to repent when he wanted to inherit the blessing, that is, no repentance in his father. Therefore, by way of a major explanation of the passage in verse 18, for you have not come to Mount Horeb in Sinai, as did those under the first covenant, but you have come to Mount Zion, which is in heaven, leading to this final exhortation, refuse not him who will one day shake both earth and heaven. As you teach and preach through this chapter, we recommend that you underscore a number of classical historical Christian doctrines that are taught in this book. From verse 2, the crucifixion, exaltation, and enthronement of Jesus Christ. In verses 3 and 24, Jesus' atoning sufferings on our behalf. 5 and following, the divine sonship of Christian believers. Verse 14, holiness in the sight of God. 15, the doctrine of the grace of God. In, verses, in verse 22, the afterlife in the city of God. In verse 23, God is the judge of all. And in verse 28, the coming kingdom of God. If you lead discussion groups or train others to do so, provide a number of discussion topics or queries that can be posed and let learners find their answers in the text. So after reading verses 1 to 3, you might ask, what difference does that cloud of witness make in our experience? What is that sin which so easily entangles us? How does looking at Jesus or considering him actually help us? After verses 4 through 7, just how difficult is it for most Christians to remain loyal to Jesus? And what is God's purpose in allowing unpleasant experiences or even persecution? After verses 8 through 11, ask and discuss, what are some beneficial outcomes of a proper response to adversity for Christians? After verses 12 through 17, how can we obtain the holiness without which no one will see the Lord? And what kind of counsel should we give to those who want to give up on God? After verses 18 through 21, what was the Israelites' experience of God under the first covenant? After verses 22 through 24, what awaits those who remain loyal to the new covenant, who remain loyal to Jesus? Lastly, after verses 25 through 27, you might again ask, what is the sin that can so easily entangle us Christians? And what is one day going to happen to the world as we know it? Remember, you can download these queries with recommended replies from our website at hebrews.cura.download. Lastly, your assignment for this week. Your homework is to read through Hebrews 12, 1 through 27 once a day this week in different translations. As you do so, please jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. As a project, answer this question. How does one attain unto the holiness without which no one will see the Lord? You can formulate an adequate reply to this query with insight you gain from the following passages in Hebrews. Stop the video now and copy down these references. Lastly, prepare a one-page summary of your project and share it with your Bible study group.
As you and I learn to look at Jesus and to consider him, we too will experience more of the joy that is set before us.